Okay, so again we begin with a new lecture, we will continue about x-ray diffraction as we were talking in the last lecture. So, in the last class we are talking about uh, the x-rays um, basically uh, the, the absorption edge in, uh, of various materials and how that absorption is, edge can be used in one choosing appropriate filter to allow certain radiation to go through certain radiation for you to use. And secondly, uh, knowledge of absorption edge can also be useful in choosing appropriate radiation for a particular material. For example, for iron it is not appropriate to use copper, but you can use cobalt or chromium uh, radiations. So, now let us look at uh, representation of X-ray diffraction in crystals. Uh, we will not look at the physics of uh, X-ray diffraction in crystals because of lack of time. But if you are interested, you can go through uh, any standard book on X-ray diffraction such as X-ray diffraction by B. D. Kaliti or uh, uh, even there is a good interpretation of X-ray diffraction in Charles Kittel solid stress physics which talks about diffraction uh, and uh, uh, essentially what happens in these cases, those cases is that since um, uh, X-rays are radiation, they have a wave vector, this wave vector is reciprocal as a wavelength. Uh, so, the reciprocal is basically the, the, uh, the reciprocal of uh, length. Okay. So, it has a unit which is meter inverse. So, in order to deal with extra diffraction in, in that case, one also has to consider lattice in reciprocal terms. So, you use a reciprocal lattice vector instead of real lattice vectors. And then you can understand diffraction in the form of what we call as Lau equations or uh, evolved sphere which gives you a certain diffraction condition, uh, which gives you a diffraction condition, which ultimately uh, can be reduced to a uh, scalar form which is called as Bragg's law. So, we will straight away look at Bragg's law uh, in term to interpret the X-ray diffraction in crystals. So, we begin with uh, Bragg's law. Now, Bragg's law basically uh, you consider you have a these parallel plane of atoms so let's say this is a uh, this is a plane which is hkl okay So, the, and the blue ones are the atoms. Okay. So, these are the atoms. And hence, uh, so this is HKL set of of planes and the interplanar spacing between these is d d is the interplanar spacing so d is interplanar spacing so what you have here is you have a x ray beam that comes from certain direction let's say uh, let's put it in green so so, let me first draw the normal to this. Okay. So, we have x ray beam which comes along this direction and it gets refracted in this direction okay. and this will be the outgoing beam right so this is i in this is i out and this is so this is let's say transmitted beam so let me just write it differently because transmitted and this is let's say i out this is the outgoing or diffracted beam 
So, we have a parallel beam coming from here as well and this parallel beam uh, comes in such a manner, so that it hits. So, sorry, it is kind of gone a little bit weird. So, I have to draw this in this fashion, so that it, it, it comes in. So, you have a parallel beam which comes like this and then this also gets diffracted. Uh, transmitted in this fashion and this goes through the lattice in this form. Okay. The angle between, so this angle, um, the, the angle which it makes through uh, with the plane, so this is the plane here, so this is the, if I draw this as yellow let us say, so this angle here is theta, right this is also theta and this is also theta, this is also theta and this angle will be 90 minus theta and this is also 90 minus theta. So, in some sense it looks like as if it is having, it is a reflection, okay. but it is not reflection because reflection can occur at any angles as we will see it does not happen at any angle. Okay. So, now here if I do some geometry. Now, for diffraction to occur basically the path difference must be equal to the multiple in integral multiples of wavelength. That is the condition for diffraction to occur which comes from Thomas Young's experiment. Okay. So, if I now make a geometry like this, the path difference is sum of these. right? So, this is A, this is B and this is C. So, the path difference I can write as is equal to A B plus B C. Okay. Now, by geometry I can say that this is this is 90 degrees, this is 90 degrees, this is theta and this is also theta. So, this becomes d sin theta and this also becomes d sin theta. So, this is basically 2 d sin theta and this 2 d sin theta the diffraction Bragg's law says that this must be equal to n lambda integral multiples of the wavelength. So, this is what is basically the Bragg's law. So, here n is defined as order of diffraction, theta is the Bragg angle or the diffraction angle, lambda is the wavelength. So, you can see here since, uh, so since you are using a, let us say if you are using a fixed lambda, if you are using a fixed lambda and you know from the knowledge of, uh, so this is d h k l all right, d h k l is not a random value. Okay. So, if you have 1 0 0 plane, if you have 1 1 0 plane, if you have 1 1 1 plane and so on and so forth, they have specific values. right? Specific values will mean you have a specific d h k l s specific d h k l s will mean you have a specific theta values to satisfy this equation, because lambda is fixed. Okay. So, for a given value of n and lambda your d sin theta product is it has to be equal to n lambda divided by 2. So, which means if your d is fixed theta is fixed that means diffraction cannot occur at any random angle it can only happen at those angles at which this equation is satisfied. So, that is why there is a different fundamental difference between diffraction and reflection. Although it looks like reflection, it is not reflection, it is diffraction which satisfies the Bragg's law, whereas reflection can occur at any angle. Secondly, reflection is only a surface effect, diffraction is a subsurface effect. The information from the surface below the surface also comes out. Okay. So, the path difference must be equal to the integral multiples of wavelength and theta in must be equal to theta out. 
and you can see the angle between the diffracted beam and the transmitted beam. What is this angle? This angle, this angle is 2 theta. The angle between the diffracted beam and the transmitted beam is 2 theta corresponding to the Bragg angle. So, this is a typical uh, Bragg's law uh, essentially and uh, you can see now for crystals uh, we have um, uh, let us say a cubic crystal. So, cubic crystal if you say for a cubic crystal D will be equal to A divided by root of h square plus a square plus l square all right so n lambda will be equal to 2 into a divided by square root of into sin theta so you can see that your theta will depend only on square root of h square plus a square plus l square so that is how you index your planes. So, when you go from various h k l values, so you start from 1 0 0, your h square plus k square plus l square will be equal to 1. What is the next value for h square plus k square plus l square? That is 4. So, this will be theta 1, this will be theta 2 and as you go to what is the next one? 1 1 1, this will give you a value of 3, this will occur a value of 3. So, this will be the so, for this h square plus k square plus l square is the smallest theta 1 will be the and this you can see the reciprocal right. So, basically you can see that sin theta is proportional to right. So, theta 1 is uh, the smallest and it increases right. So, as you and now what is happening to d spacing? The d spacing is decreasing. So, this is decreasing, your theta is increasing. So, theta is increasing and d is decreasing. So, 1 1 1 you can go to now 2 0 0 that will give you 4 theta 4 and then you go to 2 1 0 that will give you 5 theta 5 and so on and so forth. So, basically when you look at the x-ray diffraction for a cubic crystal at least when you look at the x-ray diffraction peaks they go in the order of increasing values of h square plus k square plus l square as a function of theta. So, as theta increases h square plus k square plus l square increases. Now, next thing I would like to come upon is what is the significance of in the equation n lambda is equal to 2 d sin theta what is the significance of this factor n which we said it was order of diffraction in some cases they also called as order of reflection. Okay. Reflection is a misnomer, but it is used very frequently. Okay. Now, what it means basically is that uh, let us say if you have 1 0 0 plane for 1 0 0 plane imagine n is equal to 1 then this becomes n is equal to do d 2 d 1 0 0 sin theta 1. Okay. Fine. Now, what does what does d 1 0 0 mean? Now, if you want to look at d 2 0 0 now, so this will mean again we take n is equal to 1. So, this will become 2 d 2 0 0 sin theta 2. What is d 2 0 0? It is nothing but d 1 0 0 divided by 2, because d 1 0 0 is a divided by square root of 1 plus 0 plus 0 and d 2 0 0 is a divided by square root of 4 plus 0 plus 0. Okay. So, this is a, this is right so by you can see that d200 is half of d100 so this becomes 2 lambda is equal to 2d100 sin theta 2 so basically it means a 200 peak is the diffraction peak from 200 plane is nothing but 
second order 1 0 0 reflection or diffraction peaks. So, when you have these diffraction peaks, you will have diffraction peaks in modern machines like these. So, on and so forth, this is intensity, this is 2 theta. So, let us say if this is 1 0 0, this is I am not drawing other peaks, this will be 2 0 0, this is 3 0 0, this is 4 0 0. You can call this as first order 1 0 0, this as first order 2 0 0, this as first order 3 0 0 this as first order 4 0 0 or alternatively you can say this is first order 1 0 0, this is second order 1 0 0, this is third order 1 0 0 0 and this is fourth order 1 0 0. That is the significance of n. So, this n which is called as order of reflection is meaningful in this manner. So, this is nothing but n is equal to 1 for 1 0 0, this is n is equal to 2 for 1 0 0, this is n is equal to 3 for 1 0 0 reflection okay. and this is n is equal to 4 for 1 0 0 reflection. Okay. Basically, the order of reflection, the same peak can give you, same plane can give you diffraction peaks at different angles. So, there may be no atom sitting at 1 0 0, 2 0 0, 3 0 0, 4 0 0, it is just that the wavelength is now diffracting in such a manner. So, that first it was lambda, then it became 2 lambda, then it became 3 lambda, then it became 4 lambda. Okay. So, it is as if in the first case it would be in this fashion. Okay. So, this was 1 lambda, lambda so this is lambda, this is lambda. Okay. In the second case it became this was 2 lambda, 2 lambda. It is as if you have a plane sitting here, because if you had a plane sitting here, this would be lambda, this would be lambda. So, let us say this is first set of planes, you might have a plane here sitting here, let us say it may or may not be sitting, you may or may not have atoms. So, let us say this is 1 0 0, this is 2 0 0, this is uh, this is so they are all HKL planes, but uh, it is not right to draw them in this fashion. So, if you say that this is 1 0 0 and this is 1 0 0, then the middle of it will be 2 0 0, then you can also define this as 2 0 0. Okay. So, let us first let us not talk about 2 0 0 at all, let us just talk about the 1 0 0. Now, if you have incoming beam in this fashion, uh, let me use a different color. This is incoming beam, this is outgoing beam. And this is let us say the other beam that is coming parallel to this, this is let us say the other one which is going parallel to it. The, this is the path difference, the path difference is this and if this was lambda, okay, then the path difference is lambda, okay, uh, two lambda. All right. So this is two lambda, two d sin theta. Basically, it's in this case, it's uh, the path difference is two d sin theta, and if this is equal to lambda, so which means this is lambda by two, this is lambda by two then this is 1 lambda. Okay. Now, if you had a plane sitting somewhere here, let us say, then what would be the part difference be? If I now draw a hypothetical beam coming here, then what would this part difference be? This would be lambda by 4, what would the part difference be for that? It is destructive interference. So, which means for a first order 1 0 0, there could be no second order 2 0 0 or there could be no 2 0 0 reflection, because 2 0 0 plane does not diffract at that position. For that to occur, now beam has to bend. 
okay, it has to change the angle in such a manner so that the path difference changes. So, now when the path difference has changed, let us say the beam has bent in this fashion now, so that you are now, now when you draw the, this is Now, since the angle has increased, the path length has increased, let us say this is now equal to lambda, this is now equal to lambda. Okay. So, your 2 d sin theta, 2 d sin theta has now become equal to 2 lambda. All right. What it so this is d 1 0 0. If you had a alt, if you had a plane in between then let us say the beam you draw another beam in, in, in between the path difference for this would be now half of that you can just draw a perpendicular here this would be half this would be lambda this would be lambda by 2 this would be lambda by 2. So, you can say that for 1 0 0 it is second order diffraction, but for 2 0 0 it is first order diffraction, this is what it means. Okay. Similarly, you can draw for third order, fourth order, the, the multiples will get increasing 3 lambda, 4 lambda. So, when the path difference between successive 1 0 0 plane is 4 lambda, which means you will have fourth order of diffraction. You, so, even whether you have plane or not, if you have a plane, if you have really a physical plane present, then the position of atom will determine whether diffraction will take this or not, that we will discuss later on. But if you did not have those effects taking place, then you will have a fourth order 1 0 0 if the part difference is 4 lambda and you will get the reflection uh, at different angle, because now you have now the theta has increased right. So, that is why it comes on the higher angle, because the part difference has to increase. Okay. So, this theta is lower, this is lower and this is smaller angles and this is at higher angles. Basically, you can say with respect to this. Okay. So, with respect to the normal you can say not this, but with respect to that the normal the beam has to flatten out okay? or rather other way around actually this should be lower theta. So, this will give you uh, in fact, so here you will have um, higher path difference as compared to the previous case. So, this will have higher path difference. and this will have lower path difference. Okay. All right. So, uh, I hope this is clear now. And, uh, now, when you when you want to use when you want to you uh, analyze crystals using uh, diffraction methods, there are uh, depending upon the type of crystal we use different methods. So, if you have single crystals, Single crystals generally do not give you multiple freedom of uh, orientation, because the faces of crystals are fixed. As a result in single crystals, we generally use variable wavelength so that uh, you, you have multiple peaks coming out of the sample at various. Uh, so, you, you want to get more data to analyze it. So, variable wavelengths are used. This method is called as Lauer method. Okay. There is another uh, method for single crystal, which is called as rotating crystal method. In that method again, uh, the, uh, the wavelength is however, not fixed, a uh, wavelength is fixed. So, it is a fixed lambda, but crystal rotates. Okay. So, you have a crystal, which undergoes rotation and this is the incoming beam of fixed lambda. However, in case of polycrystals, let us say powder specimens, where every plane is randomly oriented in space. So, you have every possible orientation available to the incoming x-ray beam. See, the problem with single crystals is that, if I have a single crystal specimen, then, then let us say my incoming beam is, this is my incoming beam. And there are only a very few planes, which may be 
appropriately oriented with respect to the incoming beam, especially if your sample orientation is fixed. Because remember, you have to follow n lambda is equal to 2d sin theta. If your lambda is fixed, then the only two things are d and theta which are dependent upon each other, right. So, orientation of a particular plane with a particular d spacing will not guarantee whether you will have Bragg's law satisfied or not. So, as a result you need to increase your, you, you need to change lambda, so that a particular plane will diffract. Okay? And there is no guarantee that all the planes will diffract, because there are very few orientations available. So, that is why you need to vary lambda. If you do not want to vary lambda, then you need to create more opportunities for theta, which means you need to rotate the crystal okay, for diffraction to occur, so that you can get some data out of it. However, in case of powder specimens, in case of powder specimens, if you have bunch of powder, one HKL might, might be like this, another HKL might be like, like this, another HKL could be this, another HKL could be this, another HKL could be this. So, you can have multiple orientation of HKLs. So, when the beam comes, it will always find a peak for, it will always find some plane for diffraction, which is oriented perfectly according to Bragg's law. So, for powder specimens, we generally use fixed wavelength. Okay. So, lambda is fixed and angle may or may not be changed the sample may remain stationary or sample may rotate. Then okay, by and large we can keep it fixed, but we need to change the detector position. So, if this is your uh, incoming x-ray beam, if this is your sample, if this is your detector, so this is in, this is out. If the sample is single crystal, then you need to, uh, if you move the detector, so, detector will move in this direction, your normally your beam is fixed, you will not get much diffraction only from those planes which are favorably oriented, not from anything else. Then because you know you need to satisfy this 2 theta geometry, if 2 theta remember for diffraction to occur, you have to have for a given plane theta in, theta out as uh, equal. If this geometry is not maintained, then you will not get diffraction. All right. So, in case of powder specimen, uh, since there are multiple orientation present all over the place, uh, so uh, you will have diffraction taking place. All you need to do is that you can keep the X-ray beam fixed. You can keep even your sample fixed. You can just move the detector. Whereas in case of single crystals, you may have to move the sample. You may have to move the incoming beam as well to get the maximum diffractions occur maximum diffraction possibility. So, this is what uh, is, uh, these are the three methods which we use for uh, diffraction in crystals. Uh, the Laue method for uh, with the, which has variable wavelength for single crystals, rotating crystal method with fixed wavelength for again for single crystals, then we use powder method for, for the powdered or polycrystalline specimens. So, this is for polycrystalline specimens. If you are not clear about what polycrystalline and single crystal specimen are, I will uh, explain that a little bit in the next class. Okay, so, in the next class, we will again discuss X-ray diffraction, its utility to crystal and uh, give you certain examples before we move on to finally, the defects in the materials. Okay.